Dave Young alongside Stephen Semple here for the Empire Builders podcast. And Stephen just whispered in my ear what our topic is for today's podcast. And for the life of me, it's gone now. I can't. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> it's been corrected. And then he's retyped over it. We're going to talk about liquid paper today. See what I did there with that, that little joke about he typed it into my head and then... Wiped it out? Yeah, it was a very small... Except not wiped out liquid paper. It was a very small <laughs> joke, yeah. So I did get asked a clarifying question. Are we talking about liquid paper or white out? It's not white, it's the other brand, the other guys. Yeah, no, we're talking about liquid paper. So I have to admit that I have read about this invention. I think it's a fabulous story. I think it's so cool. It was invented by a woman whose name is Betty Nesmith Graham. Betty Nesmith, later known as Bet Nesmith Graham. She was born in Dallas, Texas, and uh -huh. she was not a chemist or an engineer. She was a single mom who was a secretary. She started the business in 1956. And in 1979, the business was sold for $47.5 million. $47.5 in 1979. 1979. That's not a bad retirement. Are you going to dig into who her son is? Yes, was? absolutely. There's a neat tie in there. The, yeah, her middle name is is the key there, right? T tell us her yeah, name. Yeah, it again. is. Yeah. Bet Nesmith Graham. Nesmith Graham, yeah. Yeah, Bet Nesmith. So Bet's mother owned a knitting store and had taught her to paint along with doing other crafts. And her father was a manager in auto parts company. So she grew up in this very middle class family. And at 17, she dropped out of high school. She married a soldier, Warren, and had a baby boy. And when Warren returned from World War II, they got divorced. And Bette was left single to raise a child, which let's face it, back in the 50s, that's a tough gig. So to make ends meet, she worked as a secretary at Texas Bank and Trust. And money was tight for her and her son, but she worked hard and she started as a typist, and eventually she rose to being the executive secretary at the bank, which at the time, that was the highest job available to women at the bank. So she did very, very well. Yeah. So while she was doing this job, IBM came out with a new line of electric typewriter. So remember the one that had the, yeah, had the ball on it? And it was faster, and it used a carbon film ribbon. The Selectric. I actually have, oh my gosh, this is going to take me just a second, but bear with me, Stephen, because this is going to be worth it. Eh, it may not even be on my phone. If I choose an alarm, turn it on, go to the settings, and uh, choose the sound. <laughs> you ready? You ready? Ready. <laughs> <laughs> this is part of their That's advertisement, it. too. I have this one, too. There's a better way to put words on paper. There's a better way to put words on paper. And she figured out a better way to take them off. <laughs> what she found was, so this electric typewriter was faster, used carbon film ribbon, but there were some drawbacks. Uh -huh. First of all, the keypad was a lot more sensitive, so more mistakes were happening. Oh, yeah. And they were hard to correct because carbon could not be erased without smudges. Yeah. Did you, did you ever type with one of those? Oh, I did, actually. I learned how to type on one of those, yeah. Though they, yeah, those keys were so sensitive, right? They you, were. I would have... Like you'd breathe on it and it would... Yeah. It would, <laughs> just, just as I would get my hands down to the keys. <laughs> so to make extra money, Beth had this side hustle where she painted window displays at the bank. And she oh, wow. realized... And here's the realization that she had. As an artist, you don't correct mistakes by erasing you paint over it. Ah, yeah, yeah. So she decided to take this approach to typing. And after work one day, she went to the library to look up a recipe for tempera, which is an age-old water-based paint. And mm -hmm. she whipped it up in the blender because it, it uses like egg whites and things like that. And she whipped it up in the blender and she poured it into an empty nail polish bottle and started to use it at work. Nice. For correcting her mistakes. And she actually tried to keep it a secret. But word got out, and other typists wanted to use it, so she started to sell it. So by 1957, she's selling 100 bottles a month, four or five bottles a day, and she ended up turning her garage into a little mini packing plant. She paid her son and friends a buck an hour to fill little glass bottles and put on a label. The first name she had for the product was Mistake Out. Mistake Out. That was the original name, Mistake Out. 
And she realized at this point she had a business, but she needed to make the product more consistent. So she got help from her son's chemistry teacher and an employee at a paint shop, and they kept tweaking the formula. And on weekends, she started traveling around Texas, pitching it to wholesalers. And she had almost no success with that. Stay tuned. We're going to wrap up this story and tell you how to apply this lesson to your business right after this. Hey, Rick, how's it going? Okay, fine. <laughs> that doesn't sound okay. Well, what is it? My business. What about it? You probably wouldn't understand. Hit me. Well, you know I love it. But? My revenues have flatlined and I'm not growing anymore. Okay. Well... It's frustrating and depressing, and it was so much better when we were growing. Oh, I bet it was. And nothing I've tried has moved the needle. What about talking to Steven? Steven who? You know, the guy that hosts this podcast. Really? You think he could help? I hear he runs a paid-for-performance marketing agency. I wonder how that works. Why don't you ask him? How? Book one of those free starter sessions on the podcast website. I don't know. You can't say you've tried everything. If you don't try this. You're right. I might even learn something. I bet you do. Thanks, man. Let's go grab a bite. Yeah, sounds good. Right after you call Steven. Okay, okay. Book your starter session on this podcast website. Just visit the Empire Builders Podcast dot com and click on get started let's pick up our story where we left off and trust me you haven't missed a thing they could not see the potential and how often have we seen that with new products when's the last time a wholesaler had to type up a memo well there you go right right absolutely and how not often the user right and how often we've seen this with new products that they just can't get their head around it mm-hmm mm-hmm she decided she need to market it herself and so she took out an advertisement in a National Supply magazine, and she sold all 500 bottles that she had in stock. Sold all, right. all over the United States, including 400 bottles to GE. But here's where things get interesting. So one day she's busy at work at the bank, and she accidentally signs off a letter, the Mistake Out Company. <laughs> <laughs> From the bank. <laughs> From the bank. Uh, she was fired. They found out she had this gig and, and she was fired. But it turned out oh, to be okay. a great thing. Turned out to be a great thing. And I don't know where the origin of the name change happened. But in 1958, she realized Mistake Out was the wrong name. And she changed the name to Liquid Paper and filed for a patent. And I really wish I could have found where the origin of the liquid paper name was, but mm. I was unable to come across that. She continued to get help. She enlisted Bill Merrow to further refine the product. And Bill Merrow was credited with not only perfecting liquid paper, but he also invented things like clumping cat litter, and, and he worked on space shuttle heat tiles and developed a way to artificially age scotch. That's where you might come across his name. Uh, a really uh, a renaissance man, a modern day Da Vinci kind of guy. Yeah, improved the rubber skin on robots at Disney World, did oh, a wow. bunch of things. So he worked with Bet to improve the formula. And by 1964, they're selling 5,000 bottles a week. And by mm. 1967, they're doing a million bucks in sales. And she worked hard to promote the product. She advertised on Tonight Show, in Glamour magazines, Fortune mm. magazine. By 1975, she has to move to a bigger facility. She moved into a 35,000 square foot automated facility that was making 25 million bottles a year. 1979. Guess who came along to buy them in 1979 for 47.5 million? Gillette. Gillette. <laughs> That's not who I was thinking it would probably have been. Gillette. And, and sadly, six months after selling the business, she died of a stroke. But the company was very progressive at head on site daycare facilities. So think about this. You know, in the 60s and 70s, on site daycare facilities, an employee owned credit union, there was wheelchair access, there was tuition reimbursements, they had a racially integrated staff and recognized in Texas, recognized affirmative action policies. This is a business started by a single mom. Right. Right. No, no venture capitalist tech bro is going to do those things. No. Especially in the 60s, 70s. Exactly. Like, yeah. I mean, that's, man, groundbreaking. And one of the things that she did is she made sure her son was taken care of because he not only was there the wealth that she had built in the business, but he also got an ongoing royalty for the sale of liquid paper. And you know what? He went on to become a pretty well-known 
little dude himself. Now, now she she might have helped give him a leg up, but he ended up doing okay for himself, right? He sure yeah. did, because if anyone has listened to episode 88, we talk <laughs> about Michael Nesmith. He was a member of the Monkees and the guy who came up with the idea for MTV. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm a huge fan of Michael Nesmith and his mother as well. What a cool story. You know, to me, one of the lessons here, we talk about this a lot with clients and in our, our, our Wizard of Ads world. It's a, it's a technique called business problem topology mapping. Problem topology. And so basically, you look at the problem at hand and you look for ways that that same problem has been solved in other industries, in other categories. And the fact that she was an artist doing signs on windows and painting over mistakes is the only thing that led her to coming up with paint to paint over mistakes in typing. Because yeah. that problem had been solved by window artists, right? No, we don't we don't scrape it off and start over. We paint over. And even the first iteration was an old style of paint that she went and researched. Yeah. And that's where she started. You could even say that using nail polish bottles, right? Because it easily could have been, oh, well, you have like a little jar sitting on your desk and a, and a paintbrush. This stuff dries just like nail polish. So you've got to keep the lid on and you got to keep it tight. And it's actually the same size bottle. So the same problem that was solved in nail polish. And you know, I had not even thought about that. The lesson I had down here was, you know, she knew from painting and being an artist, she took that idea and applied it, which was don't erase the mistake, paint over it. Yeah. But man, I did not even think about who else has learned how to apply this type of thing in a small manner, which actually her customer would be used to, which was the mm -hmm. nail polish bottles. So that's brilliant. I did not even connect that. It's the thing she had around and had handy. Yeah, no doubt had nail polish bottles sitting around. I hate making um, not a sexist comparison here, but the fact that all of the people doing all of the typing in the 1950s and 60s were women. Yes. And expected to maintain their femininity and have good looking nails and all of the things that led up to this are things that made not only this product perfect for her, but perfect for her intended audience. Yeah. They're just naturally going to love it because it's going to save them time. They already understand how to use it. No instructions required. Now, the no. other part that I also really admired is that when she went to wholesalers and they resisted, she realized, well, what I've got to do is just go straight to the customer. And so she advertised straight to the customer. And we've seen that on lots of other of these podcasts where a new product comes out and the existing industry doesn't understand it, doesn't get behind it. And all of a sudden, when you go straight to the consumer, straight to the end user, they're like, oh my God, this is amazing. And you know, often when I meet with businesses that are fairly new businesses or startups, they're hoping their whole distribution strategy is, uh, I'm gonna get it in the Walmart or I'm getting it in the Costco. And, yeah. and, and really a lot of the times your best strategy is, especially if it's a new innovative product, you got to go around all those things and go straight to the customer. Get it into the hands of consumers and they're going to walk into a store. These women are going to walk into an office supply store and say, I want some of that liquid paper. Right. And the guy's going to be like, what? You know, liquid paper. You paint it on the page after you make a typo. That store owner is going to contact the distributor and go, why don't we have this? Exactly. Exactly. Oh, well, she was in here six months ago, tried to hawk it to us and no. Yeah, you know, so so you get it in the hands of the consumer, they're going to demand it from their suppliers. And if they don't, you can sell around them. Exactly right. Exactly right. So, you know, there was a number of things that I really admire in terms of what she did. And it was a great story. And she raised a pretty amazing son as well. Thanks, Stephen. That was a fun one. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Please share us, subscribe on your favorite podcast app, and leave us a big, fat, juicy five-star rating and review. And if you have any questions about this or any other podcast episode, email to questions at the Empire Builders Podcast.com. <laughs>